week on Book Notes, our guest is John Morris, former picture editor for the Washington Post and the New York Times. He joins us to discuss his recent book, Get the Picture, a personal history of photojournalism. John Morris, author of Get the Picture. Where did you get that title? Well, that's a, that was a struggle, believe me. Uh, it took two years to find the right title, and now we're struggling to get a title in French, which is even worse. <laughs> but, uh, so we don't have a title in French, but Get the Picture is, is an active title, and uh, my editor came up with it. Whose picture is this? It's a picture by David Turnley, who happened to have won a Pulitzer Prize for his work in South Africa. It's in South Africa. And the photographer you see is, Dave, is uh, Jim Noctway of Magnum, who's probably today's most celebrated photographer. He's won the Robert Kappa Award of the Overseas Press Club three times. And you don't get that easily. You said the magic uh, two words, Robert Kappa. Right. Who was he? Robert Kappa was perhaps the most famous uh, war photographer of all time. Uh, Many people have now seen a, a new movie called Saving Private Ryan, which was based on the landing on Omaha Beach on D-Day, June 6, 1944. And I was the editor of Bob Kappa's pictures of the real thing. He was my colleague at Life magazine. Uh, it wasn't his real name. No, his real name was Andre Friedman. He was born in, in Budapest and uh, took the name Kappa because it was short and good in almost any language. I want to come back to Robert Kappa in a moment, but John Morris lived in how many places in the world? Well, there's six cities in my life. I grew up in Chicago. I've worked mostly in New York, but I spent a year in Los Angeles. I've worked in Washington for several years, and during the war I lived and worked in London, and now I live in Paris. What organizations have you worked for in your life? started out with Life magazine all through World War II. That's where I got my basic training. And uh, then I became picture editor of Ladies Home Journal, executive editor of Magnum Photos, which is an international cooperative picture agency and with offices now in four cities. And then I got into newspapers, first the Washington Post and finally the New York Times. And when I went to Paris 15 years ago, I cooked up a job as uh, Paris correspondent for the National Geographic. Where do you live now? Paris. And throughout these years, what was your job? I was always a picture editor. I was kind of a lazy writer, and I, f I became comfortable working with pictures, and especially with photographers. Uh, photographers are kind of like children, and, and uh, I've known so many photographers, I feel as though I have children all over the world. Who is in this picture? I'm afraid it's me. That's, that's the kind of thing I did as a young reporter for Life magazine. And that was taken in uh, California right after Pearl Harbor. Uh, and it's a, it was a lighthearted story intended to show how soldiers shoot craps. It never ran. <laughs> Go back to Robert Kappa and that famous photo that we've seen. I think it was on Stephen Ambrose's D-Day book cover. Uh, right. Where was it taken? And when did he take it? And how did you play a role in all this? Well, uh, I was the London picture editor for Life, and there were six Life photographers assigned to cover D-Day. Uh, the one we counted on the most was Robert Kappa, who ha had so much experience in covering wars. He had covered the Spanish War, the war in China, the war in North Africa and in Italy. So we all looked to Kappa, and indeed he volunteered to land with the first wave on Omaha Beach. Tuesday, it was Tuesday, June 6, 1944 was D-Day, and we waited all day Tuesday for pictures, and we waited all day Wednesday. But we, uh, we, where, was, where were the pictures? Where was Kappa? Finally, Wednesday evening, uh, a courier came into the, uh, the life office with four rolls of film from Kappa and a handwritten note saying, John, that's where the action is. So I told the darkroom to rush me contact prints for editing. It, we were under terrible deadline pressure. The whole world was waiting for our pictures because we had to pool our pictures with the wire services. So a few minutes later, a young darkroom lad came rushing into my office, almost hysterical. He said, John, the pictures are ruined. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're in such a damn rush. I put them in the drying cabinet 
and the heat got them. Uh, there was, I closed the doors, which wasn't normal, and there was too much heat and the emulsion ran. So I went back to the dark room with him and looked at the pictures, one at the, the rolls, one at a time. And there was just after nothing on the first three rolls. But on the fourth roll, there were 11 discernible images, and that's one of them. How did that picture become so famous? Well, it was, it was the lead picture and the lead story in Life magazine. Uh, the picture was, that picture was wired throughout the world by AP, UP. Uh, it looks like it's out of focus. It, uh, it does. Uh, Life published a caption under it saying it was slightly out of focus because of the photographer's excitement or something like that. Actually, the, the light level was so low that there was just no depth of field. I mean, he had to shoot very, very slow. And of course, it, I don't think it had anything to do with the darkroom accident that looks that way. Where are the other, would you say 11 pictures were salvaged? I, yeah, I think my recollection is that I printed 11 that night. We had to print everything uh, four times to go through censorship. Uh, I think there are nine images that survive now in the archives. The other two probably were inconsequential. Who is this photograph? That is Kampa himself at the racetrack in Paris. And uh, it's a picture by his friend and my colleague uh, also, Henri Cartier-Bresson, a very famous French photographer. And um, when I landed in Paris uh, after joining Magnum in 1953, the first thing Bob did was to take me to, to Longchamp, to the racetrack, to uh, place some bets. And as it turned out, I won and he lost that day. <laughs> what was he all about? And how important was he to the, somebody like you that uh, knows all these photographers? Well, I became kind of a member of his family. Uh, I met him first in 1939 during a, a lull in his war coverage. He was in New York. And he came to see the, uh, the editors at Life, and I was a young reporter on the Life staff. And um, uh, he had a kind of a sly uh, look to him. I mean, he was, uh, we were so, we were roughly the same age. Bob was about three years older, but uh, such different people. But, uh, you know, me from the south side of Chicago and Bob from, uh, from Pest, <laughs> Budapest. And, uh, but we all we hit it off. I remember taking him skating on the Rockefeller Center rink where we used to go at lunch hour. And the first thing he did, because he couldn't really skate, was to grab onto the arm of the prettiest girl on the rink. And and uh, it was fine, except he, they took a spectacular spill right in front of the executive uh, lunch windows where, they, where some of Time Inc.'s executives were, were lunching. I couldn't help but notice it. <laughs> and I uh, got a big kick out. Anyway, Bob was a lot of fun. He he. He was charming. Uh, women fell for him. He had a long affair with Ingrid Bergman uh, just after the war. Uh, that one ended rather sadly. You'll, you'll, she writes about it in her memoirs. But uh, and speaking uh, of that, where's this picture from then? Uh, well, that's a picture of Ingrid Bergman taken by another Magnum photographer named David Seymour, whom we nicknamed Shim because his Polish name was totally unpronounceable. I can't even do it. But Ingrid was living in Rome. That's her, one of the twins she had by Rossellini. And uh, Shem uh, became a, 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 a friend of hers. And tragically, he died a short time after that picture was taken because he was killed at the, uh, the day after the Suez War ended in 1956. There's a photograph in here. It was taken by a man who was 18 years old at the time. Uh, anybody who lives in this town knows, knows him, Derek right. Halstead. Uh, what is this? What are these two photos? Well, that was one of the saddest days of my life. Um, I told you I was Bob Kappa's editor on D-Day, but that was June 6, 1944. But 10 years later, May 25th, 1954, Bob accepted an assignment for Life magazine to cover the French war in Indochina. I didn't want him to go. I had to offer it to him. I was the executive editor of Magnum and made the, such arrangements. I telephoned to him in Tokyo and said, you know, don't go. It's not our war. But he said, don't worry, I'll be back soon. But on May 25th, uh, two weeks later, he stepped on a landmine and um, died instantly. So when his film came in, I had his very last frame printed with the sprocket holes and everything, the, the black border around it. And um, 
as a kind of testament to this really tremendous photographer, one of the, he's one of the truly greats of the 20th century. And who's Dirk Halstead who took those pictures? And I also had to help the family make uh, funeral arrangements. We had a memorial service in the Quaker meeting in, in Amawak, New York, in um, Purchase, New York, and then buried him in a small little Quaker cemetery. And um, as we were putting him in the ground, a young photographer came up, and one of the family members said to me, uh, John, this is a private moment. And uh, I said, OK, but it's, look, who's, look whom we're burying. The photographer was Dirk Halstead, who now lives, in, lives here in Washington and works for Time magazine. On the back of your book, you have this photograph. Why did this make it to the back cover? Well, that's a photograph by W. Eugene Smith, whose nickname in the war was Wonderful Smith. Uh, he was famous in the, in the Pacific for his war coverage. He finally be, was wounded on Okinawa. He'd been a colleague of mine at Life magazine from 1939 on. And um, he joined Magnum after quitting Life in, in 1955. And um, when the Andrea Doria sank, I persuaded Gene to come into New York and work through the night with me. He would only do it if I stayed with him because he was afraid he'd, he'd f fall asleep. And uh, as we waited on the docks for the survivors of the, uh, of the sunken ship to come to, uh, to land, Gene noticed this nun holding a teddy bear, hoping that it would, uh, it would welcome a child. And uh, it's a curious picture. It's, it's, a, it's sort of an odd uh, way to report that story. But it's a picture that, that has lived in, in photo history. Why is it unusual? Well, what do you think of when you think of a shipwreck? You think of people uh, waving from uh, the survivors, uh, glad to be alive. This woman isn't a survivor. She's just greedy. She's there. But the, the anxiety in her face, the, the beauty of the face, is what um, gives it uh, its quality. I'll never forget, we stood on the pier with other news photographers, and I was really ashamed of the, of the press on that occasion. Because these, um, these survivors from the Andrea Doria were landing on the Ile, uh, they came back on the Ile de France, and uh, as they, as the ship drew up to the pier, the news photographer said, "Hey, wave, wave," you know, you, which I thought was terrible because these people felt, I mean, they were glad to be alive, of course, but it was such a synthetic way to report the occasion. You say in the back that. 13 of the photographers, and you write about 53 photographers, if I remember the number right, in your book, are now dead. Right. And that's, they've died since you started writing this book in 1989. Yeah, sadly, uh, my generation of Life magazine is just disappearing so fast. Uh, I went yesterday in New York to a luncheon of the Time Life Alumni Society, and there wasn't a single Life photographer f there from my, my era, not one. Well, why did you write the book, and how did you go about putting it together? Well, I've been a journalist all my life, a picture editor all my life, but um, I've worked on daily deadlines, weekly deadlines, monthly deadlines. But a book is kind of the toughest of all. I didn't realize how hard it would be. I just felt I had to do it to kind of sort out my life. And it took me eight years, a long time. It was three years since Random House accepted it. What was the toughest part about doing this? Uh, cutting it. <laughs> I had more to say, and uh, uh, there's always, you know, uh, but uh, books have to be cut to, uh, anything has to be edited, and I respect that, I, and I had a good relationship with my editor, uh, but that was the toughest part, what to leave out.